Good afternoon, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens. Let's Talk Gardens. We are glad to have you here today and so excited about the topic. My name is Cindy Brown. I am the Manager of Collections, Education, and Access here at Smithsonian Gardens. And it's always thrilling to hear from our speakers. I learn something every time, and I hope you do as well. And today, our speaker is so important because next week is Pollinator Week. So we're so excited to have Samantha with us because she's going to be discussing pollinators and her work with them and telling you a bit about her background. We will be able to answer questions, hopefully, but put them in the chat box, please, so that we can then direct the questions to Samantha at the end of her presentation. So as always, Zach will share information with us during the presentation in the chat box if you want to follow along with that. And he'll even tell you how to record the chat box if you want to record that information for yourself. We will work on having this program. Uh, we're recording it, of course, as you know. And then Zach will do the editing to the closed caption. And we'll make it available on our Let's Talk Gardens video library, which is so much you have to scroll down a lot to be able to see all the wonderful programs that we have already recorded. So Samantha, pollinators in the Mid-Atlantic area. We have some wonderful pollinators and I know you have some wonderful pictures. And for those of you that visit a lot of public gardens, this is one public garden I haven't even visited yet. So I'm excited to get up there and see uh, what's being done. It's that new of a garden. Can you tell us about the garden and tell us about the pollinators that you have? And I'll be back in a bit. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here with all of you today. It is a spectacular day here up in Villanova, Pennsylvania. I hope it's just as wonderful where you all are. And again, I'm talking about native pollinators of the Mid-Atlantic today. Um, again, my name is Samantha Nestori. I'm the engagement manager at Stonely, a natural garden, which is one of the newest public gardens in the Philadelphia area. Stonely has a really long history of landscape architecture. Um, so there have been designers and landscape architects working at Stonely for over 150 years because it has been in a state for that long. However, in 2016, the Haas family who lived here at Stonely for over 80 years decided to donate not just their home, not just their estate, but also an endowment fund to support us in our work to turn this estate into a public garden that is free and accessible to all. And there has been a lot of change in the garden and we've had this beautiful opportunity to reimagine what historically was a very traditional uh, 19th or 20th century style uh, estate into something imaginative and new all of which focuses around our idea of finding beauty in biodiversity. So using native plants at the core and creating beautiful um, and beneficial gardens, not just for people, but also for wildlife. And so some of the work that we've done has taken place in reimagining existing planting spaces. So spaces that used to be taken up by English yews and skip laurels and things like that, and turning them into very diverse gardens that showcase native plants that are native to Eastern North America. But we're a 42 acre public garden. We only opened in May of 2018. So we've only had about five and a half, six years under our belts of doing these transformations. So we also have this opportunity to take these existing, maybe natural spaces or larger spaces and make them more ecologically beneficial. So for example, in this photo, this historically was mowed grass for years and years and years. And when we started to rethink what this looks like here in the new age of Stonely, we decided let's let that grass grow long. We don't have the resources just yet to turn it into a planting bed, but by letting that grass grow long, we're increasing the ecological benefits of this area. And I mean, look at the lighting over this long grass. You can't beat it. 
So again, we're using native plants to create these beautiful and biodiverse gardens that are beneficial, not just to humans, but also to wildlife. And we have really seen that if you plant it, they will come. So just in the past five years, we've seen tons and tons of different species of wildlife come to use the garden. Everything from mammals like red foxes, the, uh, this is an example of one of our very baby red foxes that is here uh, in the garden this year and two years ago, we had successful dens. Birds, uh, we have over 113 different bird species that have been recorded here in the past five years. And of course, my personal favorite, although I am biased, that is insects. And when we talk about insects in general, uh, a lot of people do think, pollinators and that, you know, insects make up the majority of our pollinators. There's a couple things uh, that are not insect pollinators. And I'll talk about one of those uh, at the end of the presentation today. But pollinators are so, so, so important. Uh, and if you don't know what a pollinator is, a pollinator is just any species that transfers pollen from one plant to another in order to create the next generation. So you can see this carpenter bee absolutely covered in pollen right here, really having a grand old time. So we're all very, very familiar with bees as being kind of the hallmark pollinator uh, group in this region. And that is for a reason, and we'll talk about that. But there's other groups that also pollinate. Wasps, an often maligned group of insects that people tend to hate. Hopefully you'll walk away today with just a little bit more respect for our wasps because they are so very cool and beneficial as pollinators. Butterflies do some pollination, moths do some pollination, flies, beetles, and this last category is where we kind of transition out of insect pollinators and into this other category of pollinators, birds. Um, and here in this region, we only have one bird pollinator, but head to any tropical area, you'll see lots of bird pollinators. Um, some people may ask, what about bats? Uh, bats are pollinators, just not in the mid-Atlantic. Go to the southwest of the United States, go to tropical areas, bats are serving as pollinators, um, but not here in the mid-Atlantic region. So I'm going to move through each of those categories of uh, pollinators. And first up, as I mentioned, are bees. And there's a reason that people think about bees when they think about pollinators. It's because they are the champion pollinators. They are highly evolved and they're specialized for pollinating. So it makes them really indispensable, especially when we talk about our native plant species. And one thing that's really important to realize is that, you know, some folks may have this idea that bees are gathering pollen for themselves, and that is by and large not the case. Adult bees are associated with pollen because they collect that pollen for their young. They collect them for their babies. Um, Bees are holometabolists, so that means that they have an egg phase, a larval phase, a pupil phase, and an adult phase. So they are feeding their larvae this really highly nutritious pollen. The adults every so often will chomp on some pollen for a little bit of protein, but mostly adults are collecting sugar and pollination is a byproduct of that nectaring habit. So what is a bee? It's hard to define bees, but they are in general, hairy insects um, that have four wings and generally seen visiting flowers. Uh, one distinctive feature of bees is that all of these hairs that we see on them are branched, especially the ones that are on their thorax, which are right above kind of that yellow uh, fuzz that you see on this particular bumblebee. Um, and they're branched or plumous, which means that they have branches in their hairs. And that means there is more hair for pollen to stick to. So they're increasing that surface area so they can collect as much pollen as efficiently as they possibly can. There are a couple of bees that are hairless and that's because they don't collect pollen. There's a group called cuckoo bees. If you know anything about yellow-billed cuckoos or other cuckoo birds, they actually parasitize nests of other bees. So they don't need as much hair. They're not feeding their babies in the the traditional way. Um, so just an example of, especially with insects, there is an exception to every rule. 
In the United States, we have over 4,000 species of native bees. In the Eastern US, over 750 native species, and in the Mid-Atlantic, 450 approximately native bee species. Uh, so that is a lot, a lot more than people generally think about when they think about our bees. So before we kind of start talking about the types of bees that we'll see pollinating, we have to go over some life history. And life history is just essentially, how does a bee live its life? What does it look like? And first things first, that's really important to understand is nesting habitat. Because once we know nesting habitat and pollen preference, um, both of these will help us to support these bees in our open spaces. So nesting habitat, in general, we can break down bees into ground nesting, cavity nesting, and stem nesting. Stem nesting is kind of a form of cavity nesting, um, but generally we break them down into these. So ground nesting, they're nesting under the ground. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Cavity nesting, they're using holes, maybe in wood, maybe in your fence, maybe in um you know, a tree trunk, something like that. And then stem nesting is when they use hollow stems uh, in order to nest. So this sec second faction of life history of bees that we have to talk about is pollen preference. A lot of people think that bees will just visit anything they want. And that is the case for a lot of bees, but not all. So polylectic is what it's called when a bee can collect pollen and successfully raise their young on lots and lots of different plants, pollen from lots and lots of different plants. Um, and again, that does apply to many of our bees. But we kind of move down one tier, we're looking at mesolectic. And this means that these bees can only successfully develop on the pollen from plants within one plant family. So depending on the family, that can be a lot of species, that can be not a lot of species, it all depends. And then we go down another level, oligolectic. This is a group of bees that can only successfully develop on the pollen of plants within one plant genus. That's crazy. And I'll have a lot of examples of these oligolectic bees. Believe it or not, 25% of our native bees are considered specialists. And lastly, we have monolectic, and that is bees that can only successfully develop on the pollen of one single plant species. The specialization in insects is crazy, and it is so, so, so cool. The last kind of category I want to talk about within life history of bees is sociality. So that's essentially, are bees living together? Are they not? So I'm going to look at this table, and I promise this is the last table that I have, but it does help to break down the social system within all insects. So first up, we have solitary. Now, this is most of our mid-Atlantic bees. They are considered solitary or communal. Solitary means each individual female's making her own nest, laying her own eggs, raising her own young, and they live for a year. Communal means that they might have a common nest site, so females are nesting near each other or in the same nest, but they're still each laying their own eggs, raising their own young, doing all of that. Quasi-social is a uh, Insects that share a common nest site and they help each other to raise the next uh, generation, but each individual female is capable of laying her own eggs. So, but they'll raise those young together as a group. Semi-social is where there's a common nest site, they're sharing that nest site, they're raising the next generation together, and there are reproductive castes. Now, this sounds like a really weird kind of terminology, but it essentially means that there is a queen, there are workers, and those are the females that go around and they help to raise the next generation. They're the ones collecting pollen and doing all of that. And there are drones, which are the males. So they go out, they, may, they help to uh, create the next generation, but they're not helping to raise them. And then lastly, the most social of all social insects are called eusocial. That means that they've got that common nest site. There's a queen, there are workers, they're working together to raise the next generation. And that nest is considered perennial. It means that it comes back year after year and there's generational overlap within the nest. So I know that's a lot. We'll kind of break it down a little bit as we talk about bees that exhibit each of these specific social systems. But first up, 
Speaking of you social insects, those ones that have queens and workers and generational overlap and perennial nests and all of that, I have to take a quick minute to talk about what we're not going to talk about. And that is honeybees. Um, we're not going to be talking about honeybees because they are not a native species. A lot of people have this idea that honeybees are a native species. They are not. It's right there in the title, European honeybee. Uh, these bees originally came from Europe and they have been established as essentially livestock. So humans brought them over, humans raised them. Um, and they have really been responsible for spreading European honeybees all across the world. So they exist now uh, in almost every single continent uh, in, in the world. And again, European honeybees, they have the queen, they have the worker, they have all of these things and a perennial nest site. And the reason I bring them up is not just so you know that honeybees aren't native, but also so you know that honeybees can have negative effects on our native bees. So looking at this um, review of honeybee related literature and literature uh, looking at managed bees. So primarily honeybees are managed bees. Um, there are a few other species that are managed as well, but 53% of the studies that this literature review looked at reported negative effects of managed bees on wild bees. That's a lot. And um, looking even more importantly at pathogen transmission, 70% of studies reported potential negative effects of managed bees on wild bees. So not only are these bees out competing our native bees for resources, but they are also spreading disease and pests to our native bees, um, which could explain why we're seeing decreases uh, in our bee populations. So my last note, honeybees, they've had a really great PR agent, but we're gonna move forward and we're gonna talk about our native bees who really need our assistance and deserve to be known. So first up, one that probably everyone is familiar with are our bumblebees. They're in the genus Bombus. These are ground and cavity nesting bees. They are semi-social. So that means that um, they have all those things that we had been talking about with the cooperative brood care and um, the queen and all of those things, but they have an annual life cycle. So that means that um, their nest doesn't hold over year after year. The only individual that survives into the next year is the new mated queen. So they spend all year building up the colony. They create this queen. They feed her lots of really delicious stuff. She goes out and she mates in the fall. She finds a really nice place to spend the winter. She emerges in the spring. And then finally, um, she emerges in the spring, she builds that entire nest all together uh, for that next year. She ultimately dies with the rest of the colony and that new mated queen starts that cycle all over again. These guys are, or these ladies, I should say, because the females are the ones that collect the pollen, are polylectic. So that means that they can survive on the pollen of lots and lots of different species. And in the mid-Atlantic, we have 17 species of bumblebee. And just one quick little video because bumblebees are considered our strongest pollinators, which makes them really adept at pollinating certain plants that require a little bit more muscle, like this closed bottle gentian. Look at that bee! So that video might have been a little bit fuzzy for you, but um, sorry about that. Might have been a little bit fuzzy for you, but uh, just know that our honeybees are very, very strong pollinators. Something else that may, or, I'm sorry, our bumblebees. Uh, something else that makes our bumblebees really, really important is the fact that they can do buzz pollination. Buzz pollination is a specialized pollination technique that is used on plants that have unique anther morphology. So anthers are those little bits that hold up the pollen. Here you can see all those little yellow things that are long, kind of look like seeds on sticks. Those are anthers and anthers hold pollen. In about 6% of all the world's flowering plants, species, 
these anthers have parasitical morphology. So that means that there's a pore where the anthers come out. It's not all of the pollen isn't just readily available. And that's where we need buzz pollinators, especially our bumblebees. So what they'll do is they'll grab all these pollen, uh, these anthers together in their arms and they'll buzz their flight muscles. So they literally shake the pollen out of those anther pores. Um, and bumblebees, again, one of our strongest pollinators. So they are some of the best buzz pollinators that we have. So bumblebees are nesting in abandoned burrows. They're nesting in next, nest boxes, dense vegetation, rock piles. So again, they're considered cavity nesting. Uh, sometimes that dense vegetation, not so dense. You can see this bumblebee uh, nest here on the right, uh, but there's also one over here on the left using an abandoned nest box. Really, really cool um, way for us to see these uh, nests and ways for cavities to be used by these awesome, awesome pollinators. So one species that I wanted to highlight is the common eastern bumblebee. As its name suggested, suggests, this is the most often uh, encountered bumblebee in eastern North America. So it is very much the common eastern bumblebee. Now, these guys are one of the few bumblebee species that aren't experiencing population decline, and that's because they have a bit of a competitive advantage over the other species in the mid-Atlantic. So they have pretty large colony sizes uh, and they have an unusually long flight season. So that means that they emerge earlier than other species in the spring and they're active later in the fall than other species. So again, this is one species that we're not seeing a lot of decline in. Um, and I will say just a note, bumblebees are really tough to identify. So um, even me, I don't know how to identify them all to species. Uh, it all depends on size. And you think with that different coloration that we'll see in some of these species that it would be easy, but no such, no such luck, unfortunately. So I mentioned that the common Eastern bumblebee among the few bumblebee species that aren't experiencing massive population declines. Unfortunately, most other species are declining. And these two species in particular are experiencing rapid and devastating population declines. So first up, we've got the American bumblebee, Bombus pennsylvanicus, really adorable. Um, and this is listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. And rusty patch bumblebee, this might sound familiar to a couple of you. This is listed as critically endangered, and it is the only bumblebee that is listed on the endangered species list here in North America. So there's a ton of different factors that are going into why these bumblebees are experiencing population decline and why insects in general are experiencing population decline habitat loss and fragmentation, um, the reduction of native species biomass and diversity, not just in our natural areas, but in our backyards, uh, and increases in commercial bee industries. So those honeybees having uh, that pathogen and pest transmission to these native species, and then add into that climate change and um, uh, pesticide use. Unfortunately, our insects are experiencing all of this and really being impacted severely. So moving on to uh, everybody's favorite, I am sure, and by that I'm being very sarcastic. Uh, lots of people do not like carpenter bees, but they are pollinators. So let's try and find some great things to think about uh, large carpenter bees. So here is an example. They look kind of like a bumblebee, except they have generally shorter hairs. And do you see their abdomen? In this case, it is all black and it's really shiny. And that is because large carpenter bees don't collect as much pollen as they do, as bumblebees do. So they don't need as much fur or hair on their bodies. They also have really large eyes and strong mandibles. And they're called carpenter bees because they burrow into wood. And it's really fascinating looking at their nests that they create. Uh, unfortunately, they tend to create them in our pergolas and our decks and other things like that. But that's because they used to, prior to humans being here and making things out of wood, they used to use 
dead wood that was in the forests. Um, and so these bees uh, gathered pollen, they take them back to their nests, they'll create like a mass uh, that they put spit into, and then they'll put it at the back of their nest. Then they'll take wood pulp and create these little barriers within this kind of nesting chamber. And in each chamber, there's a mass of pollen and they lay an egg. That egg hatches, it crawls out, it eats that pollen, and then they will re-emerge um, after they have gone through their entire life cycle. Um, really important and interesting thing about carpenter bees is if so they are solitary, but if nesting sites aren't readily available, they'll actually move to a quasi-social lifestyle. So multiple queens will come together and raise their young, and the few dominant queens within that group, or um, I'm sorry, female, female carpenter bees will all come together. They'll raise the next generation together, and just the one or two strongest female carpenter bees will lay eggs and the rest of the females will just help them uh, raise their young. But once, if next year there's more nest sites available, they'll go back to their solitary lifestyles. Really interesting. So sweat bees are the second largest family of bees in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, generally pretty easy to identify. They're small or medium size, definitely much, much smaller than our bumblebees and our carpenter bees. They're often metallic, sometimes this beautiful green, sometimes they have striping, sometimes they're blue metallic, and sometimes they're more of a dark uh, black metallic color too. Uh, they are ground nesting, so they're nesting in the ground for the most part. They are mostly solitary. Uh, some of them are considered communal or subsocial, so they'll kind of share a nest site, and they are mostly polylectic. So they're mostly uh, visiting lots and lots of different plants, but there are a few specialists. Um, and yes, this is the bee that you'll often see visiting your arms if you're sweating. They're not trying to sting you. They're just gathering some salts to increase their nutrient loads. So as long as you don't bend those elbows, you won't get stung. Instead, just admire them and their beautiful coloration. So I mentioned there are some specialists in this group. So specialists, in this case, oligolectic, that means that uh, there are species that can only survive on the pollen of uh, plants within a single genus. And in sweat bees, there is, for example, a species that can only survive on the pollen of our native anothras. So anothra biennis over here, this is, um, uh, I would say an enthusiastic native plant. So if you've got a border or a ditch or something like that, where you can let this grow, that is fantastic. Common evening primrose. Um, and there is a species that's associated with these plants. We also have uh, our helianthus specialists and helianthus are our native sunflowers. In this case, this is uh, sunchoke. Uh, which is a another enthusiastic, I would say, sunflower species, but we have lots and lots of different native sunflower species. And then we have Pontedaria cordata. This is pickerel weed. If you have a pond, there is a specialist bee on this cool species, um, and you can grow it in ponds or along marsh edges, things like that. Really, really neat species of plant that supports a sweat bee. We also have our leaf cutter and mason bees. And one thing about um, our leaf cutter bees in particular, you'll see that her belly in this photo is yellow. And that is because instead of holding pollen on the hairs on her thorax or on her legs, like our bumblebees and honeybees do uh, in those big masses, she holds the pollen that she collects on her belly. So if you see a bee and she's got a lot of pollen on her belly, you can say, I know what that is. That's a leaf cutter bee. So leaf cutter and mason bees are general, they are cavity and stem and ground nesting. So a lot of diversity in this group. They are solitary bees. So they're not creating uh, nests or colonies. And again, they are mostly polylectic, uh, gathering pollen from lots and lots of different plants. And you might be wondering, why do they have the names leaf cutter bee and mason bee? And that is because how they build their nest. So mason bees are called mason bees because they use clay or soil to line the nests 
and to create these different cells within their nest. So here we can see a mason bee using this uh, hollow stem of probably bamboo or a reed, something like that. And even within the nest, it is all lined with clay and that big kind of brown, uh, you know, clump that you see, that is the uh, mason bee pupa. So that's right before it emerges as an adult. And then leaf cutter bees, not with clay, but with bits of leaf, they line their nests and create these different chambers within. And you can know that there's a leaf cutter bee at work if you see these really cool little curly cues cut from the edges, especially of redbud trees or black cherry trees. They'll use a variety of different leaves, but they do have a couple favorites, redbud being among them. And I mentioned that they're mostly polylectic, so mostly generalists, but there are some really cool specialists. And the one over here, for all you thistle haters out there, um, this may be a way to your heart. Uh, our native thistles support a specialist uh, leaf cutter bee, which is really, really cool. We've also got a pretty underrepresented uh, type of plant, this pink fuzzy bean or the strophostyles. These are vines, really gentle vines. Um, there's a specialist on this a group of plants and on phacelia, our native phacelias. Here it, uh, is fernley phacelia, one of my favorites, but all of the phacelias can be used by the specialist megachylid um, of this genus of plants. One more cool group of specialist bee is the yellow loose stripe bees, and it is right there in their name. They specialize on our native loose stripes, particularly our yellow blooming loose stripes. So they're ground nesting, they're solitary, and in this case, we have three species uh, in the mid-Atlantic. All of them specialize on our yellow blooming native loose strife. That specialization is crazy. And it's really, really interesting because if we didn't have these loose stripes, we would automatically eliminate three species of bee because without the loose stripes, we don't have the bee. Um, so two really cool species that you can add to your garden or to your spaces, fringed loose strife and lance leaf loose strife, both really beautiful. Um, and at one note about these bees is that in addition to using the pollen, they also specialize on the floral oils that this plant produces. And they create this really highly nutritious mass of pollen and floral oil to feed to their young. All right, I've been going on about bees a long time. I just have one more group, and these are the minor bees. The minor bees are in the genus Andrina, and they are called minor bees, as you can see, because they are ground nesting and they mine their own nests. Uh, they are solitary. Every once in a while, you'll see them all kind of nesting in a similar site, and that's just because that soil is prime for their nests. It's not too wet, it's not too dry, um, but they are not territorial in that way. They're not aggressive at all. They're very, very sweet. Um, and many in this group, you know, I've been using most are polylectic, many are polylectic, but in this group, many are oligolectic. So we have a lot of specialists in this group of bees. And minor bees, most of them emerge in the spring but there are species that emerge in the summer and in the fall. And you can see just the diversity of their nest structures. Some, you know, very simple, just one line, one channel down into the ground. And then we have this one that kind of looks like an octopus and this other one that looks like an alien monster. It's really, really cool to see the diversity within this group of bees in terms of their nest structure. So one of my favorite uh, species within this group is the spring beauty mining bee. And it is named that because it is oligolectic or specialist on our native spring beauties, of which we only have two species in the mid-Atlantic. Claytonia virginica being the most popular and most common, but we also have Claytonia caroliniana. And one really fun thing to note about this bee is that most of these bees are really tough to identify. They all are kind of the same size. They all are kind of the same color. However, 
This species you generally can identify, and that's because of her pollen pants is what I like to call them. So if you see this kind of mass of pollen on her back leg, you can notice that it's pink. And that is because the pollen of these spring beauties is this really beautiful light pink. So if you see a small little bee in early spring and she has pink pollen pants, say that five times fast, you know that she is most likely a spring beauty mining bee. So if you've got spring beauty, make sure that you keep that um, because it is supporting a really cool specialist species. But there are so many specialist species within this group that specialize on a wide variety of native plant genera. So we've got a geranium specialist. We have a golden Alexander specialist. We have aster and goldenrod specialists. We have violet specialists. So all of this is just a really great excuse for us to turn to native plants when we're planting in our gardens, because it's not just about the plant. It's about all the relationships that that plant brings to your garden space as well. And who needs, who doesn't need another excuse to plant blueberry, you know? Ugh. Amazing. <laughs> All right, so we're officially finished with bees. We're going to now move on to one of the most misunderstood and maligned groups of insects, and that is wasps. Wasps are very related to bees. They're highly evolved uh, and they do have social structures. So we talked about that sociality within bees. Wasps also sometimes exhibit sociality, but we're mostly going to be talking about um, solitary wasps. Those are the ones that may look really scary, but aren't. And that's because they're not protecting a central, nests, a central nest. So wasps act as pollinators as adults, and it's mostly just by proxy because wasps have really active lifestyles. They need a constant supply of sugar. So they are nectaring on these plants. They're gathering that sugar, um, but in the process with their slightly hairy bodies, they are also pollinating in the process. So grass carrying wasps are one group of wasps that are really interesting and they're very aptly named. You often see them carrying grass. So a nice, easy identifier for you. And so what happens is the females will make a nest in a cavity like a hollow stem or a hollow tree, something like that. And they will line and protect the nest with bits of grass. So she goes around, she uses her really strong mandibles, she gathers grass, she tucks it in there. And then she goes out and she finds members within the group Orthoptera. So she finds katydids and she finds crickets. And what she'll do is she will sting a katydid or a cricket. She will carry it back to her nest. She'll shove it into the back of her nest She'll lay an egg on top of that host and that egg hatches and it crawls inside of that Katie did or cricket and eats it from the inside out. So a little bit morbid, uh, but a really interesting life history. So she will do that. She'll collect. And again, they're specialists. Uh, in this case, not on pollen, but on their prey for their young, she only collects Katie did and the crickets, not anything will do, only Katie did and crickets. And she'll fill that nest using grass to kind of differentiate those cells between those eggs. Uh, and she'll keep doing it until uh, she gets tired or the season is over. But again, as she's doing this, I mean, imagine hauling something as big as you and flying with it. That takes a lot of energy. And so that's why we see these wasps visiting flowers to collect nectar. Now this group of wasps, also solitary, also um, specialized on a certain type of prey, but they operate a little differently. These are the sculeid wasps. And especially this photo on the right, Take note, first of all, beautiful, beautiful bluish wings, um, pretty distinctive rusty colored abdomen with those two yellow spots. Take a mental picture or take a physical picture of this, which is called the blue winged wasp in particular, and keep an eye out in the late summer and early fall. Now that you know what this looks like, you're not gonna be able to stop seeing these really, really cool wasps. So 
These wasps, again, visiting flowers as adults, taking nectar, accidentally pollinating. You can see lots of pollen gathered around the neck uh, and under the thorax of the wasp on the left here. And then these wasps, you'll often see them flying in these figure eights over grass. And that's because they are using all of their sensory receptors to figure out where there are ground dwelling scarab beetle larvae. That's how specific this gets, ground dwelling scarab beetle larvae. And then once she finds one or detects one, she digs her abdomen down, she lays an egg uh, inside of that grub after paralyzing it. And then again, that egg hatches and eats that grub from the inside out. A little morbid, but guess what? A type of ground dwelling scarab beetle larvae is. That is Japanese beetles. So we do not like Japanese beetles, right? They're a non-native species. They eat lots of our plants. So when you want, uh, if you want to take care of those populations, add a little predator into that system, think about blue winged wasps. And there are ways that we can attract them to our gardens. First of all, don't use pesticides. Do not use pesticides. But second of all, we can plant some of their favorite flowers. And those flowers are generally goldenrods, and mountain mints. And these are two that I've seen lots and lots of these blue winged wasps on. Okay, butterflies. Lots of people think about butterflies as really important pollinators. They are some pollinators, but they are not very important pollinators, but I wanted to address them just in case. So they're less efficient than bees and even wasps at moving pollen because they're really perched on top of these long legs and they use these long straw like mouth parts. So they're not getting really, really close to that pollen, but they still do. Their um, wings are made of scale, so they do pick up pollen. Uh, so uh, one group of butterflies that we'll see visiting lots of flowers are our swallowtail butterflies in the group Papillionidae. I just like to say that. So these are our swallowtails. For instance, this is a spice bush swallowtail our black swallowtails, pipevine swallowtails, um, and tiger swallowtails, all visiting flowers, generally um, attracted to bright colored flowers uh, dur in, during the day, of course. We also have our blues and our hair streaks. These are much smaller butterflies, probably doing a little bit more pollination because they are smaller, they're getting closer to that pollen um, and generally identifiable by their very fast flight pattern. They generally have these spots or small stripes on them and they tend to be blue or gray colored. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, common species here, but then down in the lower right-hand corner is a juniper hair streak, and that is not as common, but I wanted to throw it in because it's just so pretty. And then the last group of butterflies I wanted to highlight was skippers. So skippers are a type of butterfly. Uh, they make up one third of our butterfly species, and these guys are very tough to identify uh, to species. So they are generally brown, tan, orangish. Uh, they fly really, really fast and they've got these little hooks on the ends of their antennae. So if you see something that's flying really, really fast and flitting very quickly and is kind of small sized and it's kind of tannish brown, it's pretty much a skipper. If you'd like to delve into skipper uh, identification, good on ya. It is difficult stuff, but these guys, uh, they're very numerous and they're visiting lots and lots of flowers but they are all generalists. So as adults, they are visiting really any flower that they can access. So we've talked about some flowers that we can already plant for some other things. So instead, I wanna talk about how we can support butterflies in their other phase, and that is as caterpillars, because while they may not be specialists as adults, many butterflies and moths are specialists as caterpillars. So for instance, um, Angelica atropurpurea is a really cool plant. It's called purple stem angelica. This is a native uh, plant that's going to support black swallowtails because they only eat things in the carrot family. Panicum virgatum is switchgrass. This is gonna support the hobomoak skipper. Apios americana, American groundnut. This is going to support silver spotted skipper, our largest skipper species in this region. And this beautiful Andropogon virginicus, often called broom sedge, really beautiful grass, that's going to support the cross line skipper. So we have to think about these host plants in addition to the plants that they're visiting as adults. 
And that also applies to mods. Uh, here, I've got kind of this in-between because the clear wings are mods, but they fly during the day. So they're not quite that mothy um, kind of vibe or uh, understanding that we have we really have, but they're absolutely spectacular. They're beautiful and they do pollinate. Um, again, we need to think about their host plants because they're visiting a lot of flowers, but uh, if we don't have their host plants, then we don't have them. So the snowberry clearwing over here, this more black and yellow colored uh, beautiful moth, they feed on coral berries and snowberries, as well as our native trumpet honeysuckle when they are caterpillars. And when we talk about hummingbird clear wings, you can see why this is called a hummingbird clear wing, right? A lot of people mistake it for a hummingbird. That's how fast they fly. Uh, and this hummingbird clear wing has this redder, rustier color. And these guys, as caterpillars, are feeding on coral berries and on our native trumpet honeysuckle, but also on our native viburnums, particularly arrowwood viburnum, as well as our native uh, critigus or hawthorn species. Again, we have to think about these insects as a whole, their entire life cycle, not just when we see them as adults. And I'm hoping this video works well here. But you can kind of see why it gets this name hummingbird clear wing and it paused here, but that's okay we're going to go ahead and move on, but I really encourage you to look up these videos of these beautiful clear wings if you haven't seen them already. And then, of course, we have our true moths, the moths that are flying at night. Again, butterflies and moths really highly related, very similar life cycles. So Pandora sphinx and banded sphinx, both beautiful nighttime flying moths. They're going to be pollinating a lot of things that tend to be white or open during the evening. But again, we need to plant for their we need to plant for their caterpillars if we want them to pollinate in our gardens. So Pandora sphinx, they're feeding on grape vines, they're feeding on Virginia creeper, um, two vines that people tend not to like, but here's a great excuse to leave it go in a, a cool kind of outer part of your garden or grow that Parthenocissus um, or Virginia creeper on a fence. The banded sphinx is feeding on uh, our native primrose species and our native seed box, which is Ludwigia. So two kind of uncommon species grown in the garden, both supporting banded sphinx moths. And again, as adults, they tend to have some favorite flowers. Uh, so we've got Eastern Red Columbine, we have Delphinium, uh, which is tall larkspur, we have common milkweed, but I have found that all of the hummingbird clearwing moths that I've seen in the garden here at Stoneley have been on garden flocks, Phlox paniculata. So highly recommend that plant for you all. Moving on to flies. Can you believe that that's a fly? I know it looks like a wasp, but it is actually a fly in the group uh, Surfidae. So these are our hover and flower flies. Um, it's a real, flies is a really, really large group. They tend to do lots and lots of different things. So not all flies are pollinating, but here is an example of a group of flies that is. And these guys are pretending to be wasps and bees as a protective measure. Um, I find them absolutely adorable for trying. Some of them do a really good job. They've fooled me once or twice. So uh, as adults, these small to medium-sized flies are visiting flowers and uh, pollinating along the way, but this is a really cool twofer insect, I like to call it, because as an adult, it's pollinating, doing fabulous work in the garden, and then as larvae, they're doing this whole other fabulous thing in the garden, and that is eating aphids. So aphids have been wild this year, absolutely crazy, but I bet the uh, surfid fly larvae have been absolutely loving it. Uh, so they tend to look like these little translucent slugs. So the next time you see aphids, make sure that you check to see if there are hoverfly larvae eating those aphids for you. Because again, this is a real twofer uh, group of insects. The adults are pollinating, visiting lots of different types of flowers, and the larvae are eating those aphids on your plants. I mean, how cool is that? Giving flies a much better name, right? 
Another cool group of flies that is doing some pollinating are the bee flies. And you can see why these flies are called bee flies, especially the one on the right is doing a pretty good job of looking like a bee. As you can see, they're on pretty high stilts, so they're not doing the best pollinating, but especially the fly on the left here, you can see that there's some pollen attaching to its mouth parts and to its front legs. So this is a really interesting group. Again, they're nectaring and accidentally pollinating as adults, but as larvae, what they're doing is they're acting as parasites on other types of larvae. So these adults lay their eggs on other larvae like beetle larvae uh, or butterfly larvae or even other fly larvae and they are parasitic on those species. Um, so really, really cool example of mimicry. All right, even some of our more maligned flies actually play a role in pollination. Believe it or not, mosquitoes play a role in pollination. So both males and females will feed on nectar and other plant juices, um, and they'll transport pollen between plants. Uh, and just to give you some context, only female mosquitoes are actually biting humans and other mammals to take blood. The males strictly take nectar. And the reason that females take blood is because they need it right, but it's called a blood meal. It's right before they lay their eggs. They need that rush of nutrients right before they lay their eggs, um, which is really important for the successful development of their eggs. So uh, but I wanted to provide some more context that, okay, yes, they're not our favorite creatures, but they are doing something other than just biting our ankles in the summertime. And then we also have blowflies, which are in the group Californidae. Now, blowflies also have a bad reputation, and that is because they're often associated with carrion or dung and these other really smelly things. And that's because their larvae are associated with those things. Um, they're actually great recyclers. They help to recycle carrion and recycle dung and return nutrients back to the soil. But meanwhile, the adults will take nectar to supplement their nutrient load. So again, they're still playing a role um, and even their other kind of more disgusting role is still very important in our ecosystems. All right, our last group of insect pollinators are beetles. And beetles, I'm not gonna lie, they're my favorite group. I'm a little bit precious about them because they're such an incredible group of insects. They are the most diverse group of organisms in the world. There are more species of beetles than there are plants. And that is a wild statistic. And it's really important also to know that beetles in their role as pollinators. They do lots and lots and lots of other things with such a diverse group, you can only imagine all the things that they do. But within the group of pollination among beetles, they were actually some of the very first pollinators because uh, the first flowering plants that existed millions and millions of years ago, uh, there were no bees at that point. So they relied on beetles to do the pollination. And some of these primitive, uh, like evolutionarily primitive plant species still exist in the form of, say, magnolias. And it's absolutely fascinating that fossil records show beetles were really, really abundant 200 million years ago. And really, bees didn't come on the scene until uh, many, many, many millennia later. So what kinds of bees, uh, beetles are you going to see pollinating? First and foremost, we have soldier beetles. Soldier beetles um, in the group Cantharidae, the naming for both of these groups is pretty interesting. So they're called soldier beetles because whatever entomologist called them this, thought that all these bright colors reminded them of old uh, army and soldier regalia, this really bright coloration um, for that you know, group and, and time. But then Cantharidae comes from the fact that they produce a chemical called cantharidin, which tastes really, really bad. And that's actually the reason that they are so brightly colored. It's called aposomatic coloration. And apo means stay away, 
Soma means body. So aposomatic coloration means colors that say, stay away from my body. And uh, when a predator sees this really bright color associated, especially with insects, it generally means danger. And in this case, it's because they have this cantharidin. But we can see lots and lots of these beetles. There's a ton of diversity within the group. Um, some kind of look like lightning bugs. Others are just shining their bright colors. This lower right-hand corner is a goldenrod soldier beetle. Again, keep an eye out in September and October. You'll see these guys on goldenrods, on our sunflowers, lots and lots of visitors to our especially yellow blooming plants. We also have the adorable tumbling flower beetle uh, that is more delidae. They're really small, they're wedge-shaped, visiting um, kind of flat flowers. Again, really, really tiny. Flower longhorn beetles, another one of my favorites. Uh, this is another twofer in the garden. So for this group within the cerambicids, the adults are visiting flowers, they're pollinating, they're taking nectar. The larvae are breaking down dead and dying wood in our forests. So really important recyclers and pretty important pollinators. And when we talk about beetles and flies and what they're going to visit, they tend to visit open and accessible flowers, especially those that are white. So magnolias, we talked about that being a primitive species. Here we see three different types of beetles visiting this magnolia flower. Aruncus diochus, goat's beard, Eryngium yacopholium is rattlesnake master, a Geratina altissima, white snake root, uh, lots of things attracting beetles. And then of course, there are some flowers that are solely trying to attract flies and beetles. And those are the ones that tend to be this maroon uh, kind of meat colored, uh, you know, flower color, and they tend to have a rank smell. And that is because those things in combination remind beetles and flies of rotting meat, and they bring them to them, and then they pollinate uh, with the reward of some nectar. Really, really cool example. So we've got a trillium, we've got our wild ginger, and we've got everyone's favorite skunk cabbage. And the last pollinator I wanted to highlight, not an insect, but everyone's favorite is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Ruby-throated hummingbird is the only hummingbird species that's reliably in the mid-Atlantic, and they are attracted to tubular-shaped red, orange, and bright pink flowers. So we've got cardinal flower over here on the right. We've got trumpet honeysuckle, just another reason to plant trumpet honeysuckle. We've got Costaletskia virginica, which is Virginia salt marsh mallow. And this picture is actually taken at Stonely. So these birds doing pollinating while they are taking nectar and they visit lots and lots and lots of flowers because they have, again, a really high energy lifestyle. So um, planting these won't only attract these ruby-throated hummingbirds, but will also encourage pollination among your plants. And with that, just want to say that, you know, here at Stonely, we are just at the beginning of our journey in terms of attracting pollinators and planting with wildlife in mind. And the changes that we've seen in such a short amount of time is fascinating. So uh, I encourage you all to start the journey of planting native plants and encouraging our native species. And uh, with that, I wanna thank you all and I'm happy to take any questions. Wow, Samantha, that was wonderful. I, I love the way you broke it up on, and, the, and I like the one chart, so don't worry about that. I think that was fabulous. <laughs> that was great. But what, what great Latin you were throwing around scientific names, and I appreciate that as well, because then it gives clues uh, to the background of it. But real quickly, we only have two minutes. So one question was, um, was there honey, of course, we're talking about uh, honeybees, mm -hmm. but do any other bees create honey or have honey for their young? And do we harvest it? That's a great question. So there are eight species of honeybees in the world, and only two of them are managed on a scale that allows for honey production for human beings. Um, bumblebees and other species of bees may produce honey for their young, but it's at such a small level that really um, it's not efficient for humans to extract that honey and use it for ourselves. So, so Native Americans did not have honey available to them. So honeybees were brought over to the United States, I believe, in the 17th century. So they did not. 
No, they did not. So they had to get their sugar elsewhere. So thank mm -hmm. you. You're getting lots of claps and hands. Okay. <laughs> Another uh, uh, visitor has leaf cutter bees. Mm -hmm. She can tell because, or he can tell because of the uh, cuts in the leaves, but they can't find the nests. They can't find the stems or whatever. How far can they carry those leaf bits? Um, That's a great question. Yeah. So um, leaf cutter bees in general, I don't know the exact amount, but it is certainly within, I would say a quarter of a mile, to half a mile. Honeybees can travel up to five miles and that is a really, really large expanse, four to five miles, I would say. And so, um, and also just a note, those cavities, those nests are really, really tough to find. They're super, super secretive for a reason. So, uh, you know, it's encouraging to see that your leaves are being used by these leaf cutter bees. Um, good luck finding the nest, but it's a wider range than you might think. That's terrific. Thank you. And the last question is, uh, the study in the current issue of Ecology Letters shows that moths play just as important role as bees in pollination of community gardens in Leeds, England, and moreover, more, oh, moreover visit different types of plants. Why do bees play the major pollination role in the Mid-Atlantic? That's a great question. So when we look at England, they actually have a much lower population and diversity of not just insect species, but also of plant species. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to compare those two regions, despite the fact that we think we have like a similar climate, things like that. The diversity in the mid-Atlantic is so high that it has likely resulted in a greater amount of specialist relationships mm -hmm. within our bee species, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And I, I want to echo all of the accolades that you're getting in the chat box. Thank you. It was terrific. I love the way that you talked about the pollinator and then also gave us information of what we could put in our gardens to be able to encourage, especially those uh, specific uh, uh, pollinators that want specific types of plants to go along with it. And if our audience has never looked into buzz uh, 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 pollination, uh, they really need to do it because that is a fascinating thing, especially if you grow tomatoes, because tomatoes yes. Yep, mm -hmm. tomatoes are native roses. It's really cool to see. So definitely keep an eye on those bumblebees. And if it looks like they're moving in fast motion, they're likely buzz pollinating. Yeah, they always look like they're telling a story to me. When I'm watching <laughs> so, so thank you again so much. I can hardly wait to come up and see your beautiful garden. I appreciate you introducing us to a new public garden and hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. And thank you all so much for joining. We hope to see you at Stonely very soon. Well, all right. Bye-bye.